Picture yourself on a business trip with some of your employees. You're traveling across the country to see a client, but you get snowed in at the airport. You're now stuck with your team for the next 10 hours. How do you think you'd feel at the end of that 10 hours? Today's guest, Lisa Rosenthal, tells us why that thought experiment is something you should keep in mind during your hiring process. Lisa is the CEO and co-founder of Maven, providing mission and operational services for clients in the DOD, DOJ, and DHS. Lisa, Otis, and I talk about how you build a culture of service and why that culture creates a better work environment, and we discuss how you can build that culture even when your team is spread out across 30 states. And don't worry, Lisa gives some specific ideas too, just in case you're scratching your head. How do you know when it's the right time to double down in your business? What can you do to make sure you're hiring the right people? And how do you make the napkin business plan from a night of martinis and turn it into a $75 million company? Lisa, Otis, and I answer all these questions and more on this fantastic episode. Quick reminder to rate, review, and subscribe to the show wherever you're listening. You can also find the full videos of the show on our YouTube page. And if you learned something from Lisa, Otis, or me in our conversation, make sure to share the episode with someone else so they can learn it too. This episode is brought to you by Tribe and Purpose. The transition from college to that first career is a difficult one, and it's even harder when you lose your sense of identity. If you're an athlete who just hung up the cleats, it's hard to go from being a rugby player to being Joe in accounting. We created Next is Best to help retired college athletes use their skills to create an impact through entrepreneurship. Next is Best by Know Your Tribe will help to smoothen that rough transition by helping you establish a clear sense of purpose, an actionable path to success, and the tools you need to manage your life. Your 20s are a confusing and chaotic time. Next is Best gives you the tools that you need to make sense of the chaos and make this next chapter of your life the best one yet. You can learn more about Next is Best by Know Your Tribe at findyourpurpose.coach. Now here's Cam and Otis with the show. Hey, welcome to the Cam and Otis show. On this episode, part two, uh, because uh, I had some technical problems earlier in the week, we are revisiting to actually do the episode with Lisa Rosenthal, founder and CEO of Maven, which is really a cool company, uh, and I'm I'm excited to to get into it. Uh, there, there's several things that uh, I'm I'm ready to jump into. And number one, my number one thing I want to jump into is what the heck are you doing being fun and having fun things as a DOD contractor? Well, that's supposed to be stuffed shirt, no fun, all serious. What's going on with Maven and how are you doing that? Hey, if I'm spending 40 to 50 hours a week with people, I better like them. That's a lot of quality time with, uh, with a lot of different people and you have to like what you're doing and the people you're doing it with. I think that's the biggest reason my business partner and I started the company. We get to do things we care about with people we actually care about. Mm. So what what happened? Then, then there must have been like, <coughs> pardon me, a catalyst or something like that that you know, or that job or that boss. What what was it that you said? All right, let's go. This is stupid. There's always a good story, right? This one is probably best told over martinis, which is incidentally how Maven was started over martinis, but. It was, yeah, I had a boss that kind of said, hey, you're nothing but a young woman without military experience. And the lowest ranking I'd ever received on a performance evaluation was entrepreneurship. And I keep it posted in my office still today. And it was the lowest ranking. Um, now Maven today is, is about a $75 million a year company. So I think we've, we've done okay with the entrepreneurship thing now. There's Did been a see- lot of bumps. Did you see it as a challenge? I mean, was was it like a poke in the chest? You you ain't good enough, you ain't smart enough thing, and you wanted to show them, or, or what? I would bet there's a little bit of ego in there. If I was if I was being honest, absolutely. So, how did you? Or I take us through a little bit of that martini meeting then, because I definitely have had at least two business ventures born out of either beers or whiskeys. So take us through that a little bit and how you moved from the idea stage at with the martinis, which is a great time, and we've all been there. But then the next morning when you write the business plan is a little bit trickier. So take us through that. Yeah, well, martinis make me think I can do anything. And the funny thing is I'm not even a martini drinker. So that's (laughs) probably why this happened, right? So I called a few of the smartest people I knew that I'd been working with and said, hey, guys, let's let's go meet for drinks. And it turned out to be at a Bennigan's that's now closed in a place I typically wouldn't even go to and said, hey, I think we should quit our jobs, go to a salary zero and start a company. 
And my now business, my still business partner, Victor, looked at me and he said, well, Lisa, you have no idea how to be management. You've never run a company. You've never written a proposal. And, well, you don't have any money. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll figure it out. He's like, Mm -hmm. let me rephrase. You don't have any money. Like, we'll figure it out. We have Google. We have people that we trust. And we know how to talk to people. We'll be fine. No kidding. Six months later, we quit our jobs, went to a salary of zero, started a company. And um, it was, looking back, the wildest ride you could have ever had. And I don't know what I've told myself back then other than, what are you thinking? Mm. A lot a lot of those nights where you, you, you question that step, I'm sure, when you think about the, the, the credit card statement in the bank account, right? We took zero dollars out. So Maven has always been a zero debt firm from day one. So it was slightly terrifying and throw in, I got divorced in my first six months of running a company. So not only did I quit my very well-paying job, went to a salary of zero, started a firm that I had no idea what I was doing, but I also ended up single and moving across the country to help support our first client. So, which we still have today and I'll be going to visit tomorrow. Why, why DOD? What, I mean, was that uh, the comfort zone? Did you, did you have a, I can make this thing solve this or whatever. Why DOD in that area? Passionate about it. My intention when I was growing up, I always wanted to be a lawyer. My intention was to be an environmental lawyer and my undergraduate degree, environmental science, political science. And my statistics professor in college called me in after class one day and um, I thought he was going to throw me out, but he instead said, "Um, young lady, I'm going to hire you. I'm like, what? And I thought he was throwing me out my scholarship. He's like, you don't show up on time. Your clothes are questionable. You have an attitude problem. But in two weeks, you're starting working for me as a congressional liaison supporting space and missile programs. So I was 19 years old, and this this professor, Dr. G. Mignogno, turned out was the COO of a company named Answer. You all may have heard of it. Amazing company still, but Mm -hmm. my first job was there, and I met and fell in love with the whole concept of the soldier the airmen, the seamen. It was an unbelievable. The moment I understood what national security was, there was no way I could do anything that didn't involve national security. So you mentioned you mentioned studying or wanting to be an environmental lawyer and studying political science. That sounds like a pretty strong why already coming in. So how did that mesh with that? Because those, those might sound like they're coming from two conflicting areas, or how did you put those two whys together? Well, I don't do anything with the political or environmental anymore. I mean, we obviously do the normal check the box stuff, but it, it, you know, everybody has this whole sustainability mission. I'm a government contractor. I'm not making anything. I'm 100% services based. So it, it was, but what are you passionate about? And it turns out, I think most people who come to Washington, D.C., and I went to college at American University in D.C., we come with a set of political ideals and we believe in the government. And I think that's the impetus for me, and it is for, my, for, for Victor as well, is we believe in America and what she stands for. And to have the opportunity to work with the men and women that protect and ensure and preserve those ideals, it's the stuff that gives you the tingles and makes you get out of bed in the morning. And you get to work with other people who have those same ideals. We're never going to get mega rich doing this work. But you go to bed feeling okay with yourself. I mean, if we wanted to be the bazillionaires, we'd be in Chicago, we'd be in New York, we'd be in L.A. But we do it because I think we all love what we do. When you yeah. when you talk about the environmental side, was that something that like evolved into this? Because I think that's what a lot of people as entrepreneurs go through is that they you know they have this passion of going to you know dad. You always use the joke of save the turtles, and then they get there they're like, okay, I've worked at this government agency for three years. We haven't saved any turtles. Might as well go start a business that saves turtles. Was it that type of a thing where you were applying there, or was that just a whole change no. of heart? Or change of heart's no. not the right word, but no, no. I think I mean that's always been a part of it. That was just my education and. It's when people go to college, I think they go for ideals as well, and then they realize they actually have to make money. So, I mean, I'd like to not spend my entire life eating ramen noodles. And so, but don't get me wrong, I still love them when I'm not feeling well, but yeah, yeah, it's, just, it's, it's not a change. I think there's room for, there's always room for jello, right? You can always do the mm-hmm. right thing and still have your ideals and what you're doing. But the core mission is protecting America's interests at home and abroad. And every piece of work Maven has from DHS, Department of Justice, or Department of Defense, 
all supports protecting America. So when, when you and Victor did the high five over the martini and said, let's go, uh, sort of thing, did you put together a plan or did you go, you know, there's a contract thing that I heard about over here, let's bid on it. Well, uh, no plan survives first contact with the enemy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we had ideas, and there was actually a few more of us that fell out over the years. Um, we, there was initially, I think, five business partners, and it, people had different things that came up in their life at different times, and I think Victor and I were extraordinarily passionate about Maven and what we wanted to be and do. Um, we initially started out consulting to other businesses, so we were B2B for about 30 seconds. And then we became B2G. Our first contract is one we still have today with the U.S. Army, uh, based out of Joint Base Lewis McCord, and it was spectacular. And it's the mission that PEO Soldier has with protecting and outfitting uh, soldiers worldwide. We we still are passionate about it. And actually, Victor and I are heading out there tomorrow to meet with the Maven's first two employees who are still with us today. And we have well over 400 employees today, and we still have numbers one and two. Now, that, that's a testament to doing something right, because either that or, or being four people, you and Victor, and those two employees being the hardest-headed folks that could ever, ever be. Uh, oh, yeah. But maybe that's part of it. How, how did you create something that has enabled a couple of a couple of dudes to hang out for 10 years being part of this team well with those guys they believe in the mission as well brian and kate um they have an agreement with us they said listen we'll be the lowest maintenance employees y'all have but here's the deal you'll come out here once a year we're going to choose the most expensive restaurant we can find you're going to spend the evening we're going to order as much food and drink as we possibly can and you're going to enjoy it and then you can go away the next day and we'll see you the next year <laughs> and it has been the best relationship of my life it's probably one of the longest and healthiest ones with the two of them but yeah that's that's for real and the mission with peo soldier you can't go wrong the leadership and management at Soldier has been consistent for 14 years, and their, their service there has been amazing, and they've been able to adapt and evolve to the changing um, political and military landscape of, of Soldier. If you don't mind, just, just give us a little, what, what is PEO Soldiers for, those, for the, our, our listeners? I know what it is, but most uh, people mm -hmm. don't. Yeah, Camden oh, doesn't. <laughs> so the, the Army is structured with the Program Executive Office and they each, I think there's there's about a dozen, plus or, plus or minus a couple, and each one of them is focused on different things. So PEO Soldier with the Army focuses on the soldier as a system, and they include what we're working on specifically is called Net Warrior, which provides full situational awareness on the battlefield. So. That's awesome. It That's is. Awesome, it's, it's really And, and there is, you know, uh, for most of us, there's a very easy way to become passionate about that activity as a business owner and there's a lot of people some of them are veterans but you know just probably just as many because i have a lot of friends who, who are just as passionate about that sort of thing to make sure that joe out on the front line has the latest and greatest that he can be safe and do his job most effectively and efficiently with this piece of whatever that piece of kit or technology is. Well, Otis, it's, it's funny you say that. Um, I think the reason we are doing what we're doing is all of us that started Maven started working for an organization called the U.S. Army's Rapid Equipping Force, and they provided immediate technology solutions to the battlefield to increase you know, situational awareness, force protection, lethality. And we were working on a project there called the Ballistic Helmet. And Within six months, I think we had this ballistic helmet deployed, which is crazy when you think DOD 5000. It reduced the acquisition process to an urgent requirement from 10 years down to six months. And about four or five months after we deployed this helmet, we get it back in the mail. And in the ballistic helmet was a clear bullet hole, and some 19-year-old kid had written, don't know who you people are, but this saved my life today. Wow. And wow. I... You can't even come close to replicating that feeling. And so all the stuff that Maven does today, 
is similar to that. I mean, obviously, we don't get to have the poignancy of that because we're, we're merely support contractors. We're no longer Beltway Bandits, thank you very much. We are now Parkway Patriots. But, <laughs> I love it. I love it. Thank you. But that's what it is. I mean, our customers ranging from SOCOM to the Marshall Service, everything we do is to support the end user. Well, whether it's the agent at the Marshall Service, whether it's the Border Patrol guy at DHS, or if it's the special operator with, uh, with, the, with SOCOM, mm -hmm. it all ends up, how do we support that end user to help save or take lives, right? How do you build that into the culture? Uh, because, you know, you having that experience, you know, with the, getting sent the helmet, like that, that's something that'll stay with you. What about the person that came in and got hired two weeks ago, you know, building that kind of connection? How do you build that culture in? The hardest thing I think a business owner does, especially in government contracting, is connecting with all the people and having them believe in your ethos. Having the clients we do helps a lot. You don't go work for the U.S. government if you don't believe in the U.S. government. Right. There's a lot of other things you can do. But for government contractors, most of our people we don't see. If we get to see them once a year, it's a big deal. We're in 30 states right now. And how do you touch base with them, right? And they don't want to read corporate email. They don't want to listen to what you have. They want to call you only when they have a problem. So how do you make that a relationship where they want to stay with your firm? And that's probably my biggest interest is in corporate culture and how do you get it. Uh, Maven does a lot of very goofy things. Uh, just for Thanksgiving this year, actually every year we have the Giblet Council, and whoever tells us the funniest Thanksgiving jokes, we send a 20-pound turkey to. Turns out actually sending turkey in the mail isn't a thing the U.S. Postal Office is okay with, so now we just send a $50 gift card. But we've had some really funny jokes over the years. Um, we do holiday parties. I'm working my way around the country trying to meet with every single group. Uh, this weekend I'm going to Seattle and to Petaluma to meet with some of our Coast Guard folks down there. Uh, next week we're heading out to Fort Bragg. But keeping engagement, um, I think the most fascinating experiment we've done is I sent out an email, I think it was in May, to the entire corporate office, uh, the entire team, is about 400 people and said, hey, anybody who reads my email and responds today, I'll send you a pizza that will arrive at your house by 6.30 tonight. Did you just have to respond to my email with your favorite pizza toppings? I'm still judging the jalapeno and uh, pineapple person. <laughs> but anybody who responds. So it was interesting. I think 300 and something were actually eligible. 121 people responded. So my team and I ordered 121 pizzas in one day. It was only eligible for one day, and it said you have to read the emails. And it was only 121 people, but I think that was actually a really high number mm -hmm. um, for trying to get the engagement of people who were listening and reading the emails. Because I think another 50 or 60 read it. But the comments and feedback back on that were pretty incredible. I am still actually unsubscribing from pizza places all over the country, and my credit card was turned off five times that day. So most of that day was me calling my Amex saying, please turn it back on. And their response was, lady, you don't eat pizza. What's with all the pizza orders? <laughs> in all these different places too, in, right? Yes, in multiple states. But how do you keep them engaged? And it makes them watch. I hope I'm not one of those leaders, though, where they're like, huh, I follow her just out of curiosity. Right? <laughs> what crazy thing is she going to do next? It's always something. It is always something. How do you, because one of the things, one of the things I've, I saw when I was in the, the DOD contracting space with uh, yeah, probably 50, 60% of the companies is they chase every shiny object, particularly when they're in that, that, you know, lower end, you know, four to 5 million, they're just in revenue, just getting started. How do you keep that? reined in because I'm sure when you have this kind of people that you're describing that are excited, they have they have great ideas, they see opportunity, they're probably you probably get four or five of them at minimum a day that come down to your office and go, hey Lisa, what if we did X? I have a healthy respect for my, my uh, time away from work. I don't want anybody here working 60 hours a week. We're doing something wrong if everybody in this company is working 60 hours a week. Um, you have to very carefully choose what you're doing. 
Um, we had a killer year two years ago. Uh, Maven pulled in an amazing amount of work, and I think we spent the last year making sure we had the infrastructure and capability to respond to every single person we had to hire. And so we've been very targeted about what we do and where we spend our time. And most of that is on taking care of current people and current clients. A far second is acquiring new clients. That's what the next year is going to be about. The next year is going to be hardcore growth because when you have the first year of COVID, I had the very unpopular idea of we're still an in-person office because most of our clients were in-person. So if they're in-person, we're in-person. I actually didn't lose anybody. All of my corporate people came back in and we were one of the most successful companies in 2020. It was, no, 2021. We, we just had an amazing year. And so when you had the kind of growth we did, we actually landed almost 400 million in contracts in a one year period. Wow, that's um, awesome. That's not per year and that's, right. that's full ceiling, um, but then you spent the next year just making sure everything is structured to take care of those people and those clients. And that's what we've done. So now we structure for, hey, where do we want to go? We have the strategic meetings. We have the infrastructure and the right people. And I would tell you, as an entrepreneur, the hardest thing that we do is knowing when to let go of somebody and knowing when to hire more. Mm -hmm. People who were good for you when you're 5 million aren't good at 15 million. People at 15 aren't necessarily good at 40. And even though they've been a part of it, it's when do you get new people? When do you get new ideas? Uh, right now, my executive team, really great folks, they come from large companies. They know how to do the mid to large size firm. And so we've had to do a lot of, of staff changes, not because the, bad, the last ones were bad or even mediocre. It's just their specialty was in smaller firms where they could provide that more one-on-one -on -one support. How do you get to the next one? How do you get to the next level? And I evaluate myself all the time saying, hey, am I the right CEO for Maven, even though it's 74% you know, me, right? I own 74% of the firm, Victor has 26. Um, but what's right, what's right for the firm? Because it's not necessarily about what's right for me. And I feel like I'm still doing all right. And with the staff I have, I promise you, they would very quickly tell me if they were not okay with me anymore. What's, so. what's a, like, I guess, like warning sign that you saw that you wound up going, okay, no, I can keep doing this. But something that came up that you were like, okay, maybe it's time for me to move on. Because something we talk about all the time on the show is the entrepreneur, the founder, and then coming to terms with the fact that maybe they're not the best long-term CEO for their, you know, for their baby. So that's a tough thing to go through. What's like a warning sign? you had for that so I still think I'm the right person um, and so uh, something happened last year I was offered a lot of money to walk away from Maven like the kind of money that you can't even fathom and okay I'm still having a little tear in my eye for saying no and I knew I was going to say no <laughs> right and um, but one of one of my senior guys who knew about it came into my office and said he's, he's like can't believe I'm saying this because I would walk away with seven digits. He said, um, I don't want you to do it. He said, I don't want you to take this offer. He said, I think we've created something special here and I think we can do something with it. And this, this guy's a capitalist. And he said, no, I think we double down and, and just go for it. Mm -hmm. And I think there, were, there, was, there was probably a lot of whiskey in the next few nights when I called back <laughs> and said, I'm sorry, guys, it's not right for us. But it was... It, the, the feeling I had that day when my senior staff all came in and said, hey, Lise, this is what we want to do. Like, we believe in what we've created here. It's so unique. It's so unusual. How, how did so, you, I guess, what was it like that next month? Because that sounds to me like the startup bug. And to get that after already being in business sounds like it would be a pretty cool thing. That's something I haven't experienced. So what was it like in that next like month or so? Because it seems like that fire would be completely lit again. It was. It's, um, we doubled down. We really said, all right, guys, how do we structure it? Um, took them all on an offsite and said, where do we need to go from here? So I brought some of my senior folks together and said, what do we need to do? We just said no to the lottery number. And as it turns out, I don't think any of us were in it for the money. We were in it for the ideals. Um, my car is still a 2012 beat-up 4Runner, uh, which I love. It's not a fancy Maserati, but that's 
I could have been driving a whole fleet of Maseratis. <laughs> so. You only need one. Sigh. <laughs> right. Well, that's it. And, and there's there's some interesting uh, lessons I'm sure in this, and we've we've touched a little bit about it. In that, you now you start off with five partners, five people can get a lot done, right? Yep. Also, there's a lot of split in the revenue with five people too, so you got to get a lot done because <laughs> you ain't yep. getting much in the bank. But when you start to start to grow, and you realize that. Uh, you know, whether it's those five people then or the 400 now and you really need 420, how do you, what's, what is, can you share a little bit about the, I'll just cut to the chase, the hiring process to make sure that we get the right fit in and it's not, man, this dude's got all these skills and certifications. That's, that's the one. How do you do that? How do y'all do that? What's y'all's process if you don't mind? Wow, uh, that is a triple-edged sword question, I think. Uh, everybody gets it wrong. Everybody gets it wrong sometimes, right? It's yeah. careful to hire, quick to fire. Because these are people's lives. You don't want to bring somebody on and give them this opportunity and then say, nope, sorry, wrong, good luck, bye-bye. Because these are lives and people with families. A um, couple things. A uh, good chunk of our leadership team comes from Special Forces. And... They help design and develop what we call behavioral interviewing, where we really put them through the ringer to make sure that they're a cultural fit. I contend that I can teach the most skills. I can't teach drive. I can't teach integrity. And I can't teach personality. Those are the only three things I can't teach. I can make some, I can put somebody in a class to do anything else. But if they have those three, I can find a way to get them there, usually. Um, the behavioral interviewing has been very helpful. I'm going to give a call out to my executive coach, Kurt Andre. We have him do a personality assessment and evaluation uh, when it's a senior level staff member to see what his thoughts are. Um, annoyingly, he's been right every time. It ticks me off to no end. I'm like, no, this person is great. You're wrong. You're wrong. And each time Kurt's like, eh, I give it six months before you're calling me saying, what do I do with this jerk? And uh, every single time he's been right. It's a little annoying. But... It's you know, foster people, give them opportunities. Maven has a $5,000 tuition and education benefit for every single employee. Whether it's somebody who makes 25,000 a year or 200,000 a year, they all have the same benefit of growth and education. I would tell you, Maven is a learning organization. I am always in some type of class or another. I don't think that I should be exempt. I don't think Victor should be exempt. Uh, he's actually attending the Harvard Leadership School in January. Um, he's not speaking to me about that for a little while because it's in Boston in January. Um, not not but, good timing. So, not good timing. No, no, no. Very, very bad timing. But I'm always, I just finished my diversity and inclusion certificate from Cornell. Um, conflict management, all of us are in constant training, and I give people bonuses and raises based on how much individual professional development they do at corporate. If my corporate staff isn't the best they can be, they can't serve our customers, which are our employees, the best they can. Mm. So every single person in corporate must do This episode is brought to you by Tribe and Purpose. If you're a college athlete who just hung up the cleats and you're looking to make an impact as an entrepreneur, then Next is Best by Know Your Tribe is perfect for you. Get a clear sense of purpose and a path to success so that you can make a bigger impact and make this next chapter of your life the best one yet. Learn more today at findyourpurpose.coach. That's findyourpurpose.coach. Now let's get back to the show. Training throughout the year. I love those incentives for, you know, keep staying, staying in the learning process and keep getting better. You know, when you talked early on, you mentioned, you know, just kind of, kind of having that like, we'll figure it out mentality. Have, have you had any issue with, uh, what I would call like plateauing in productivity while working in the learning process. Like somebody comes to you, like, hey, I need this on my desk Monday. And they're like, I don't know how to do that. I'll get it to you in two months after I take this online class. Like those type of things where it's like, <laughs> hey, you know, you're in the long term, it makes sense. Like they need to go learn these things and those skills, but it can hurt the productivity sometimes. Have you ran into that at all? Not as much. We've hired skills ahead of where we've needed them. Uh, so Pat, COO, he comes to us from Lockheed Martin. Um, he's incredible. 
and we brought him in when I think we were you know, 15, 20 million dollars. We're now easily triple, quadruple that. But having a guy like that as part of your team, essential. So we hire in front of it, and all of us in the leadership team believe it's important to mentor, train, and grow everybody beneath us. We all should be able to take a vacation and not stress about the job not getting done. It's, yeah. Uh, well, you know, you, you, you mentioned something else, and uh, I'm curious about the how do you, in that aspect of, uh, I don't remember how you said, but I always say slow to hire, quick to fire. Um, you said something a little bit different. Careful to hire, quick to fire. Careful same to thing. hire, there we go. Yeah. Same, same principle, right? Yeah. Which means that we can't hire some, if we wait until we're in crisis mode to hire somebody, where everybody's working 60 70 hours a week and they're in burnout mode we're, we're too late right because then it's you know who's breathing out there and we can get in here sort of thing how do you as, as a as a business owner and leadership team in the broader sense look at what are some indicators because you know it's hey, and if this happens that happens that happens or I see this on the horizon sort of thing what are you seeing right now? What's a lesson that you could share with, with other business owners in that aspect? So Maven has a unique organizational chart. And if I had props here, it'd be great. We are an inverted triangle. So I am at the absolute bottom of the triangle. And then the CE, COO and CFO are right, right above me. And the concept is, is I work for the person above me. I have never worked for more people in my life as I do today. Oh my goodness, and it turns out 400 people means about 600 problems on a daily basis, right? Um, it, it's Because of our servant leadership inverted model, we're pretty good about managing, uh, managing what people are doing and keeping an eye on it. I really believe that I work for Victor, Pat, Heather, and they work for all the people underneath them, and it's their job to do what they need because the corporate staff has to work for the client staff because the client side staff are the people who provide the services to the, the front line. So we have to, with the inverted leadership model, which I think is right side up, I think all corporations should have the CEO at the bottom. I don't have a job without these other 400 people being happy. I don't get paid. I am a net suck on the company. I produce zero revenue. And once you put your ego aside and realize that, wow, I am a net suck, I do nothing, right? It's a pretty scary moment. Like, I don't have a job. If, if I can be cranky, I can be whiny, I can be this, I can work hard, it doesn't matter. If I am not serving the needs of the people above me, I don't get a paycheck. And I'm back to ramen noodle fiddles again. I love that. That's Again, to common people, I still love ramen, but. No, I, I love that because we always talk about servant leadership, but yeah, just inverting that triangle. Because that is really what it comes back to is that you, those, you know, you are relying on them for your livelihood because they keep, are everything that keeps it moving. Um, my, my one thought with that is, do you ever have an issue and maybe this kind of, I don't know. All my culture collection, all my culture questions seem to go back to like a self-selection thing, where you're like, "Eh, no, they're they're contract people. They get it." But <laughs> uh, I'm curious if you have any issues with people not, uh, I guess, like running things up the ladder in that way. Then, because when you talk about you being responsible for people, then it's like, okay, well, then y'all got to bring the problems to me a lot of the time. And it's kind. Of, I don't know. When I think about the inverted model, that's the problem that comes to mind. Uh, what were your thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah, um, people have no issues texting me at 2 in the morning, I can tell you that. That's some good and some bad. Um, everybody has access to me. Um, sometimes my staff is like, I'm going to limit this access. And I don't think so. Uh, if, if given the, I answer the corporate phone every chance I get. You know why? I get to find out what's wrong. I know what people are complaining about, and I can fix it. Uh, just this week, we did an exercise in the company where it was, in the corporate staff, it was, I did three ups and three downs. I'm sure you guys have, you know, in the military, you've heard of it, right? And we had anonymously, every corporate person, 100% anonymous, submit what are three good things about working here, and what are three things that can be improved or don't work. And there were some interesting moments in there to see, right? It's like, is that really what people are thinking? And it, it puts us back in check, and it's, it is a serious ego check. You get a lot of ego checks running a company. Um, 
And I like the access. Sometimes it's more exhausting. I'm trying to work on people's EQ about knowing when to walk into my office and when not to. If I'm on the phone with my doctor, please walk out of my office and don't listen to the conversation. <laughs> but that open access is sometimes difficult, but usually I can fix problems if I hear about them. I'm the only one who has to worry about my bottom line. I'm not a giant shareholder. I don't have a board of directors that I'm accountable to. I don't have uh, a stock market that I'm accountable to. I have my own conscience. I have Victor and his conscience and his family that I'm accountable to. And I can make decisions that are for the good of the people, not for the good of my pocketbook. I believe if you follow the vision, the money will come and you treat people right, and it's amazing what happens. Do the right thing, it's what is, I have a thousand quotes about this, right? Do the, do the right thing no matter who's looking right. But if somebody's struggling, you have to find out about it. Um, just recently, somebody we had, I had met with her in passing and we were just talking and her house had flooded and her dog ran away all within 48 hours. Not a big deal, but within the week, we set her up with a spa day appointment. Right, I, And it's nothing. It's not going to bring Fido back. It's not going to stop the flooding in the house. But just to let somebody know that you're listening matters. You care about them as a it human. Cares. Right. And she was like, what are you doing? Did you really just send me a massage in the mail? I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Out of anybody in the world who needs it right now, it's you. Right? Take it. But being able to have where we're just accountable to Victor and I and our ideals in our belief system. I like hearing about it from people because I can help fix things. I can make them better. But you're also in 30 states, like you said. So how are you make sure the right people are getting the massages at the right place and everything going on with that when everyone loses their dogs? Look closely. Do you see the bags under my no, eyes? No, I do not. <laughs> oh, you can see them. Makeup's not. <laughs> oh, sly, sly boy. <laughs> no, um, it's hiring the right people, right? It's the behavioral interviewing. It's having people like Pat. It's having my op staff, you know, Slappy and Kurt and Will and, and, and Tony. Uh, it's having these incredible people who are the front line talking to them every day and they know to pick up the phone and all these guys call me and say hey Lee somebody's got this problem or hey we had a hurricane down in Wilmington so and so lost their roof I'm like hey turn around get them get them into a hotel for the week we'll cover it and figure it out later or hey so and so's kid was hit by a car I'm like make the flight reservations get them out of here I, I, it's a thousand dollars it's not going to impact my life but it's going to take plane off of theirs so being accountable to to our own ethics is different than being accountable to shareholders but yeah it does mean some and that also means if somebody's fired i get crazy texts emails linkedin postings at any given time throughout all hours of the night let, let's on something and uh, we talked about this in the green room and I wanted to want this is oh no time. oh no now you've got we me worried bring this up yeah when, when nobody was listening we, and I'm gonna bring it no uh, no seriously about the mystic the mystique of business ownership there there is there for those who don't own a business and, our, and most of our listeners do in some form or fashion or very near yeah. that but for those who don't, uh, there's there's this mystique of you know the Maserati, like you said. We've all because I own a I own a business. I've got a Maserati. I have infinite infinite money. So yeah, how do you handle that? What's what's your what's your experience in that in that realm? That perception. If you will? Oh yeah. Um, well, first of all, I don't think people understand how bill rates work. We pay the vast majority out to, of what we bill the government, we pay the vast majority out in a salary. And the two most expensive things for a business owner are leave and medical benefits. So it's not like it's lining our pocketbooks. I mean, government contractors were happy for four to 10% profit. And out of that four to 10% profit we're taking, we still have to pay lawyers. We still have to pay some marketing expenses. We still have to take care of people. Some of the mystique is, uh, it's interesting. 
I was on the phone with the bank this week and one of my, my senior managers walked in and he's listening. And it was because obviously we issue credit cards to the people who need them. And we had an employee who had apparently opted not to pay their credit card for the last four months. Well, it's me, this body, that's the guarantor. It's nobody else, it's not some bank, it's not them, it's me. I'm writing out that check when they choose not to. And then I have to go after them. It's not the bank that does it. And I mean, we've had this, I've had some very, very funny stories. And we had somebody who actually used our corporate credit card once to spend $2,000 in waxing, which is very confusing to me. Like how you can spend $2,000 in waxing on my corporate card, but- uh, That's gotta be a group rate or something. It's a serious <laughs> wax job. <laughs> <laughs> it has to be something. But it's one of my favorite inappropriate use of, of company cards. But I'm accountable for that waxing, not the quality, just the paying. Um, like everything that happens around here is, is uh, it's me. I'm the last one paid. I'm the first one sued. My name is on it. And, and I tease people we have to do the right thing because my business partner is too pretty for prison. I make him sign everything. But if if people commit time card fraud, Did you hear that, Victor? Victor yeah, poor you, Victor. I, I know, I know. The <laughs> poor guy. I put him through the ringer all day, every day. Um, but yeah, he he signs everything. But he's the CFO. Brilliant, brilliant financial guy. Wouldn't have it any other way. He keeps me in check, and in exchange, I torment him on a daily basis just for fun. Uh, but. I, I, yeah, we are responsible for making sure everything happens. If there's a water leak at two in the morning, you know who's coming into the office? It's not them, right? It's I'm the first one that cancels the leave, and I'm okay with that. I took that on because of the risk profile. I think entrepreneurs have an exceedingly high risk profile. I think we like the adrenaline. I think we like the fear. I think we like the unknown. Um, I'm totally an adrenaline junkie. It's true. But to have this all, it's, it comes with a lot of, oh my goodness, and the amount of time we spend with bankers, lawyers, and accountants, the three best friends any entrepreneur will ever have is your banker, your lawyer, and your accountant. And I can make recommendations for all three. I unequivocally will tell you, Kayla, Declan, and Tim, all day, every day. So they've kept us out of jail, they've kept us out of debt, and they've, uh, that, that pretty much comes, covers it, yeah. There, there is a great business right there. You're on a first name basis with your banker, your lawyer, and your accountant. That's the relationship that helps build that success, right? They were all at my Christmas party, uh, hol oops, sorry, holiday party. Um, uh, I'm half Jewish. I feel like I can go either way with it. Uh, so at my holiday party mazel this week. Mazel Tov, right? That's what mazel Tov, yeah. Merry Christmas, Mazel Tov. Um, but at my Christmas party this week, my banker, my lawyer, and my accounting team were all there. And it was a corporate-only event. There's not three people that I would rather not have. I mean, they're perfect. We've had them all for many, many years. And the most important people in any entrepreneur's life, no kidding, you guys think I'm joking. Well, that and for the women out there, the hairstylist, too, doesn't hurt. Uh, but banker, lawyer, accountant, all day, How every day. How do you, you know, just... Just kind of broadly, whether you know it's habits or you know routine you got into or anything like that, just a kind of a tip type thing of how do you deal with all of that weight of the company like that and all of that responsibility and you know of the ownership and everyone relying, but you know it all comes back to you are the bottom line. What's one of your tricks to help to deal with that? Wait, you notice the extra weight from dealing with it all from a. A video conference. I don't think I'm comfortable with this at Dang all. I, I was so good with the bags under the eyes got a little earlier that I just walked right into that. So, <laughs> it's. Uh, I, I'll call it. There's. There's a couple answers to that. One is I'll call it the airport test. When I'm interviewing somebody to come work with me on a daily basis, I'm from small town Michigan, and um, I've had to be up there quite a few times. And more than once, I've been snowed in up there in an airport. And I'm not hiring somebody I don't want to get snowed into an airport with for five or six hours or 10 hours. Like I better like them if I'm stuck in a small airport for six hours with somebody. So one, hire people you want to work with, get rid of the ones that don't. I don't care how good you are. If your personality sucks, I'm not working with you. Period, full stop. I don't care how much money you make me. Second, uh, I like my routine. I'm a 6.30 every morning at the gym. I try not to alter it. Um, 
you have to have friends there, but for the grace of friends go I. Uh, my significant other is amazing. He, he helps deal with a lot of my crazy. Like he, hears, he hears every crazy story that goes on. And sometimes it's, have another glass of wine, dear. Some days it's, have another bottle of wine, dear. Um, it just depends on the day, right? Um, but you, you surround yourself with amazing people, and life is so much better. And you can't forget those. I think entrepreneurs, when we start companies, we're myopically, exclusively focused on the success of the company. And it, it's, it's transactional. Must do this to get this. Must do this to get this. It's not that. You have to focus on yourself just as much. Um, I was in the gym about two years ago, and I'm in the bathroom at the gym, right? We're getting more awkward. We're talking about apparently my weight in bathroom, right? But so at the gym, there's this sign on the door, and it said, 60 minutes is 4% of your day, right? And so, and I started thinking, like, that's not right. One hour is not 4% of my day. And then, of course, I called Victor, who actually knows numbers. I'm like, Victor, is this right? He's like, Yeah. So how can you, as an entrepreneur, as a human being, not spend 4% of your day on yourself? So what I would tell everybody to do is figure out a way to think that you're worth 4%. 4%. So an hour a day, I don't care if it's on you physically. For me, it's, it's the gym. It's, it's that. If it's reading, if it's meditation, if it's in a church, I don't care what it is, but you are worth 4%. So you can support everybody else, those other 96. Because those other 96%, I'm a boss, I'm a leader, I'm a colleague, I'm the stucky, I'm the girlfriend, I'm the sister, I'm the matriarch, I'm the, you choose the term. I am everything to everybody else, those other 96%, but for 4%, I get me, I choose me. And some days it's 8%, sometimes it's <laughs> negative 4%. But I think you need to really, 4%, I think there's a book in there somewhere. And it all started from a gym bathroom. So my big life mantras come from gym bathrooms and martini bars. Interesting. Well, and that leads me to something I've, we've talked nothing but business. You mentioned the journal that you've yeah. what's, what's, whether it's the favorite adrenaline thing that you've done or what's the next adrenaline thing you're grabbing onto that you're super excited about coming up? I'm definitely um, I'm a scuba diver. I've, do, I've dove all over the world. Um, just got back. Oh, what was the last one? We dove. Um, I told my significant other, I said, within 12 months, you have to have global entry and you have to be a scuba diver if we're going to stick together. He kept with it. He, he went with it. And so uh, we just dove uh, this year, Hergada in Egypt. So that was pretty amazing. Uh, we've done some wrecks down in the Keys all over the place so I'm, I'm a hardcore diver uh, given an opportunity I'm jumping off of anything I can I'm whatever I can do to potentially break a bone apparently um, I'm up to 21 broken bones <laughs> Oi. Um, you got a few more there, that's what I'm saying there's what 204 yeah. bones in the body or something like that something I I'm, I'm estimating for that count. I don't know. I'll call Victor for that count but yeah, it's, it's anything. Um, I actually just got back from country number 76, which was we spent, Chile, uh, we spent Thanksgiving in Chile like any normal couple would. So. Yeah, well, that makes, that's a very traditional. Yeah, good turkey. Uh, very traditional, it. yes, <laughs> yes. Fantastic, yeah. Well. That or uh, <laughs> hamster, yeah, guinea pig. Right? There you go. Guinea pig, yes, queen. Yes. Pig. I've eaten those. Go. I've eaten those in in, uh, in Ecuador. It was yeah. not the best thing I've ever had. It's the, oh, uh, yeah. the no thank you bite, right, Camden? <laughs> oh gosh, <laughs> bring back some memories. Man, I tell you what, uh, my my learnings uh, in this in talking with you have been amazing, and I'm gonna. Uh, I got to go with the four percent because I hadn't done the math on that. I, I talk that. I try to hold myself to that same thing. And when you put a quantification on it of that, how can you not? You know, how can you not give yourself four percent? Because flip it around, what are you doing with the other ninety six? And that, that allows you to give ninety six back to other people still. When you think about it in that sense, that quantification, it should solidify the fact 
that if you're not taking care of yourself, you can't help the other folks, right? So four percent. That that when you lay it out that way, what a what a great little quantification. You know, you put that, that's like a, a slap as you slap the sign as you head out of the office, sort of thing. Four percent, you know, or on the way to the gym or a keychain, you name it. Your book, four uh, percent. Yeah, that's that's a great great simple way to, to build on it so uh, so I got two because I had like. one quick one because early on when you're telling the uh, your pizza story Lisa about sending the pizzas all over the country it took me back to my verbi days dad with you know doing virtual events and most pizzas I sit was in was 30 people for one event and it was about five or six different states and one one guy up in Canada but that was going crazy. I couldn't imagine going to 100. So maybe it's a good good thing that I'm not in that business anymore because that would get me going gray. And yeah, that's not a fun time. But the other thing was uh, the you said the two different things. One being snowed in an airport, and then two, you're spending 40 to 50 hours a week with somebody. You better like them. And I, you know, whichever example you choose to move forward with, that is such an important thing. That it's like you got to make sure you like those people because you're spending so much time with them. Awesome. Lisa, how about you? What'd you learn? So this has been a rough week at Maven because we've had holiday parties. We've had, it was bonuses going out. We're traveling to, I think, six different states and, and lots of government meetings. And I think talking to you guys reminded me how amazing my leadership team is. We're allowed to, to fight. We're allowed to scream at each other. We're allowed to get frustrated. At the end of the day, how much I actually really like them and that I'm blessed and honored to be able to spend my 40 to 50 hours with them. It just reminds me how lucky I, I actually am and to have been careful about selecting everybody. And that careful hiring process has really paid off and I owe them a lot of thank yous. That's great, that's great, yeah. Sometimes that, that slow down and realization of, wow. <laughs> yeah, good deal. So how do folks find you and what's going on with Maven? Uh, see what you got going. What's the next adrenaline trip that you got going next? Uh, I, haven't, I haven't picked that out yet, but I'm sure it'll come up randomly. But because I book about two weeks out, I'm like, oh, my God, I've had it. I'm done. We're out of here. We're heading off to go cliff jumping in Croatia, right? And who knows what's going to pop up. But I can be found on LinkedIn. Um, I'm probably the worst social media person ever, so I apologize. I don't have the Facebook or the Instagram or I don't know what the other ones are called. Um, but I'm always available via LinkedIn. You can find me. I respond to most messages, unless, of course, you're, uh, what is it, a wealth advisor or a real estate agent, because the number of those that try to connect in with me are amazing. Don't forget a, a fran franchise or Franchise, so yes, I get a lot of those, too. But I'm always available on LinkedIn. Love meeting emerging entrepreneurs and existing entrepreneurs. Uh, sharing, sharing each other's pain and excitement, it, it's so great. I, I love sharing of people's wins and how to figure out how to change the losses. One of my best friends actually randomly texted me a year and a half ago on LinkedIn. He said, hey, I heard about you, and now we're the best of friends. And it came from a LinkedIn thing saying, hey, I've heard about you. And I'm like, what? Are you a creepy stalker? Turns out he's actually just a great entrepreneur who had some questions. So I encourage that all day long. Um, yeah, come, come, come join the craziness at Maven. We're always hiring. I think I have quite a few positions open all over the country, a lot of different skill sets. I'd love awesome. it if you came and joined this. Great. Well, well, thank you so much, Lisa. This has been phenomenal in the, in the business lessons and, and life lessons. Uh, yeah, we really appreciate you taking some time out of that busy, busy schedule today. No, I appreciate you guys. I, I couldn't thank you enough for this. You made it easy. Um, I appreciate you not, I hope you've edited out any part where I sounded too stupid or mundane, but I appreciate you guys and, and how hard you're working. I love listening to your podcast every week. It's fantastic. All thank right, you. thank you all for listening to the Cam and Otis Show, and a special thanks to our guest, Lisa Rosenthal, for joining us today. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure to pass it along to someone else so they can enjoy it too. Follow the Cam and Otis Show on Facebook and Instagram. Full videos of our show are available on YouTube, and the full archive of our episodes is available at www.caminotashow.com. Thanks again, and we'll see you all next time.